Hello, I'm Donald McCauley. Welcome to this BMJ Leader Conversation. Today I'm talking to Professor Amanda Goodall. Now, Amanda has the most remarkable title I've ever heard. A professor of Leadership. Amanda, just tell me a little bit, how did you get this title? Tell me about your career so far. Uh, well, how did I get the title? Well, I, I, I joined Academe relatively late after a career um, working with leaders um, in universities, in fact. And that, and that was to ask the, the question, should university leaders be experts in the core business? Should they be scholars, top scholars, or should they essentially be managers? And so that research I've been doing, yeah, nearly 20 years now, and I've now replicated it in many, well, actually in all, in all spheres, I've replicated it in all types of jobs um, now, including in healthcare. So what took me to be MJ leader, what took me to creating, I, I created a master's degree for doctors, exclusively for doctors in leadership and management. And that all came out of the research I did, which was focused around hospitals. Do the best hospitals in the world, are they more likely to be led by doctors or by managers? And I found that, that doctors led the most outstanding hospital systems in the world, well, particularly in the United States is where I started, but that's that's gone further now. And that research has continued to build. Let me take you back a step because many of our listeners and readers are interested in academia. So you studied the top academics, the vice chancellors, the presidents of universities, what stuck out when you looked at them? What are the characteristics that make a good head of a university? Well, what I did was basically I, I did my undergraduate degree very late. Um, after that, I worked with someone called Anthony Giddens, who was a very, very outstanding sociologist who led London School of Economics, where I did my undergraduate degree. And I worked very closely with him as his kind of apparatchnik um, special assistant, that kind of thing. And this was when he was head. And then I went to Chicago, came back and then worked with another university head at Warwick in a similar role. And I noticed that their behavior was very different. And so that's what led to the hypothesis that maybe it's because Anthony was very good at research and still focused on research that he himself in his st strategy for the, the LSE was very focused around research. And that, but that based on that, I asked that question, um, both to university leaders, deans of business schools, and then beyond, uh, I went from, you know, sports, basketball, Formula One racing, and then all kinds of businesses and professions. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm really convinced. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, an engineer, whatever profession you work in, you need to have an understanding of the core business of the organization. And in healthcare, I think that doctors and other clinicians have that understanding in a way that general managers just can't. Let me take it into that in a little more depth, because this is one of the controversies in healthcare management. Should it be doctors or should it be career managers? Give us a little more of your insights into who make the best leaders in healthcare. I suppose the, the, the core thing is that if you're if you come from the core business of any any area, if you're a lawyer, for example, and we know this in law firms, the top law firms actually tried one. One of the top London law firms tried to um, bring in a general manager to manage the firm because the lawyers just wanted to focus on their law and they they weren't interested in going leadership management. And it, and it was disastrous. And that person left pretty soon afterwards. And if you look before I go into healthcare, if you look at if you look at an organizational structure, Deloitte is the fifth largest private company in the United States. Healthcare organizations use, use Deloitte and other consulting firms a lot. If you look inside Deloitte, McKinsey, KPMG, any of these massive consulting firms, you will find that only the people who started in them as very young employees go on to be the top executives in those firms. So I just think if we look at the most successful organizations in the world, and that's where we should start, um, I'm not a great fan of consulting firms. So if you look at the most successful firms in the world, you will find that on the whole, they have been led by experts in that core business. So if we turn to medicine now, and we think about the best organizations in healthcare, there's two American organizations that top the, the rankings year in, year out. They're either, you know, one, two, two and one, one and three, whatever. And that's the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic. They were they were started by doctors and they have only only ever been led 
by physicians. They've never been led by general managers. Now they're the best organizations in the best health organizations in the United States. And in fact, if you look consistently every year at the top organizations in America, they're much more likely to be led by doctors than general managers. So why, why might this be? Well, a very simple argument is that doctors and other clinicians, but doctors um, in particular, because they have such a long training, have you know many years of having the, the patient comes first instilled into their psyche. Or what we think, you know, first and foremost is patient first, patient first. And I think that has a big, big focus on, on the strategy and always thinking of the patient first. If you think about the UK, we have, I don't know what the percentage is now, between five and 7%, maybe even less CEOs in hospitals who are doctors. If you look at Germany, if you look at France, if you look at Italy, the numbers are much, much higher, up in sort of 60% or more. And these systems are much more efficient than the NHS's. I don't think anyone would argue that they're not really, if we look at the comparators. Now, NHS has been run down in clinicians, in numbers, in money, and all sorts of things. But I still think another massive problem with the NHS is that clinicians are not um, up there, particularly doctors are not in leadership positions enough. So many of our doctors will agree with you wholeheartedly. They'll be listening, thinking, yes, as clinicians, we should be leading these organizations. But I would be the first to suggest that perhaps clinicians, they might be very good at the clinical work, but how can we teach them the other aspects of leadership? What are the other skills they need to learn and how can they learn it? Well, think about any leader. Think about a lawyer who has to become a leader. Think about an engineer who has to become a leader. Think about Mercedes Benz that, you know, the person who kind of turned Mercedes Benz around recently had a PhD in engineering. Think about Formula One racing. These are just management teams. The former, those who drove, those who raced racing cars make the best Formula One principles. Now, you know, these are these are very talented people. Doctors are very clever people. They can learn this stuff. You know, it's much easier to train a doctor or another clinician in leadership and management skills than it is to train a manager in, you know, to be a highly skilled doctor. So the idea that a doctor can't understand, you know, how to run an organization. I mean, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic are billion dollar organizations and they're only ever led by doctors. So, so yes, we need to train doctors in that. Absolutely. A number of years ago in 2015, I started the process of creating a master's degree at Bayes Business School, which is now in its sixth or seventh year. And that is that is exclusively around training doctors in leadership and management. That's exactly what we do. And yeah, I mean, we, it's been amazing. The doctors have gone, you know, a lot of them have become more, you know, that there's been sort of a rise in terms of the seniority of the ones coming onto the course, but the promotion of those doctors happens very quickly. Not only that, because it's an apprenticeship levy program, we actually have interviews with the doctor's line managers. And um, so we actually know how they're progressing. In other words, it's not just like they fill out a form and say, we, you know, we like the, the course. This is actually seeing and following their progression in their career. And we see that they are going into leadership management um, programs, um, positions on the course. Nurses have been doing leadership and management courses for over 30 years. Doctors have been excluded from that. And I don't think that that's right. So you're a tremendous advocate for the clinician leader. Give me a little picture of what you think the clinician read leader should look like. So a fundamental point here is that we don't want a pretty, you know, a lackluster doctor or a bad engineer or a, or a crappy lawyer to go, oh, actually, I'm not very good at this. I think I'll go into, into management. And that happens quite a lot in different sectors. It certainly has happened in academe. We don't want that. In other words, we need really good doctors and really good professionals to go into leadership and management because they inspire, motivate, mentor, et cetera, et cetera, um, those who, who, who are coming up um, after them. So that's one thing I would say is very important. Now, on the, on the leadership and, and management course that we do for the doctors, the first thing we do is hold a mirror up to them. So the very first module, which is an academic module, is in a sense what we would, what some people would call soft skills, but in actual fact, as they find out very quickly, the soft skills are actually the hardest ones. Um, so they have to think about their behavior. And that's because we believe that 
you know, you might be a brilliant doctor or a brilliant engineer. And if you're a narcissist or if you've just got bad behavioral skills, you're unself-aware, etc., you're not going to make a good leader. So we start immediately with these, with, with holding up this mirror to them. And we do various kinds of trainings around negotiation, around self-reflection, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say we also give them professional coaches for two years. They do action learning, all this kind of stuff. So it's very psychological. Um, the first module and I think that's really important so I would say we want um, we want people that are able to reflect to be able to control their behavior and those kinds of factors so there there's definitely generic skills that you know doctors just like anyone else need to need to kind of you know demonstrate there may be slight differences in different professions but essentially we don't want narcissists we want people who you know those kinds of things so that's really really important so I think um that's two things they need to be good at their profession, not just average or not good. And they need to um, demonstrate that they have, you know, very mature and good emotional skills, emotional intelligence and those kinds of factors. Mm. Um, beyond that, obviously, they have to retrain them in things like health analytics. Um, we train them in strategy. One of the things that I think makes a big difference to to organizations if they're led by core business experts is that they can they can see the big picture much more clearly and i think they can strategize much more clearly they can they they know what's coming up professionally etc so strategy is obviously very important um making sure you're in touch some people say oh we need outsiders because insiders are too narrowly focused well what steve jobs was narrowly focused i don't think so he was narrowly focused when he came back into apple and a former Coca-Cola marketing executive was running Apple. And this guy produced many products. Jobs came back in, cut them all, went down to four products and essentially just kept renewing them and updating them. And that's basically how it is today. So I, I actually think that core business experts are naturally better at strategy, but they need to be trained in strategy. And of course, business and management, they need to know the, the you know, they need to be able to delegate to people who understand it better, who have, whose core business is in HR or finance or whatever but but they don't need to necessarily be running it themselves but um yeah I mean I, and I think I have great faith in doctors particularly but obviously other clinicians as well but um that they are able to learn all those things and that's what I've seen in, on our course I mean it's been amazing actually you have a book coming out tell me a little bit about your book I have a book coming out which covers all of my research actually in one place and this is a this is a general business book it's not an academic book uh, and it and the reason I think it's relevant to this conversation is a lot of the evidence that I look at is based around healthcare um, not just hospitals but healthcare in general so and it's coming out in June and it's called Credible the Power of Expert Leaders so I think it, it should be a very accessible book I hope it'll be a very accessible book. Amanda, that's been absolutely fascinating and inspiring. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful talking to you.